You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between. Between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way. Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Great War episode 218. This week a big shout out goes to everybody that has left a review for the podcast on iTunes or anywhere else that allows reviews. It's still the best way to help the podcast reach new listeners due to the magic power of algorithms and so if you have a moment or are enjoying the show and your podcast platform of choice supports reviews, think about dropping one for the show today. You would have my eternal thanks. Also, I will mention this a few times before November. The first week of November, I will be in Kansas City, Missouri to attend the fourth an- my fourth annual symposium held by the National World War I Museum and Memorial. Uh, it is the first week of November, so if you're going to be in attendance, let me know. As always, the first beer, or whatever beverage you want, is on me. In this episode, we turn our eyes, for the first time in over four months, away from Russia and its surrounding successor states. The Russian Empire would be one of many that would be destroyed by the First World War. It would join a lengthy list, including the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the German Empire, and the Ottoman Empire. In this episode, we will be discussing the fate of the final empire on that list, and specifically what happened to the area that we know today as Turkey. This area had been the heartland of the Ottoman Empire, and the empire that after four years of war had been almost completely dismantled by the Allies. Large areas of the Middle East would be pulled away from the empire and into their own states, whose future we will discuss in episode 221. Within the bounds of modern-day Turkey, there would be several groups that would try to lead the new country, all of which had complicated relations with the Western Allies, Italy, and Greece. These relations would eventually deteriorate to the point of open conflict, specifically with the Greeks. They would be fighting in the heart of Anatolia, on the coast and around the capital, as Turkish nationalist forces sought to push foreign forces out of the territory that they believed belonged to them. This nationalist movement would eventually be led by Mustafa Kemal, who throughout the two years after 1918 would slowly coalesce the national support around his leadership. At the age of just 37, he would put himself at the head of the revolutionary government, whose entire goal was the removal of the Western allies and their influence from Turkish affairs. He would then go on to lead the government in 1923, which he would lead until his death in 1938. Near the end of his life, in 1934, he would be given the name that is most closely associated with him today, Ataturk, Father of the Turks. Over the next three episodes, we will track the creation of modern-day Turkey, from its beginnings as the oppositional government in Ankara, through the Greco-Turkish War, and up to the creation of the new Turkish nation in 1923. This story starts, as many of these stories have, with the Armistice. In this case, it was the Armistice of Mudros, which was signed by the Ottoman Empire with the Allies on October 30th, 1918. This treaty gave the Allies the rights to occupy several areas of the Ottoman Empire, including areas around the capital of Istanbul. It also gave them the right to use military force to keep the peace anywhere in those areas of Anatolia which were still under Turkish control. 
Mudros would then be the basis for the Treaty of Severus, which would be signed in 1920. This treaty expanded Allied control, giving the British, French, Italians, and Greeks their own areas of influence. The signing of this second treaty would represent the height of Allied involvement in the region. This treaty codified some of the agreements made at the Paris Peace Conference, most importantly the agreements made with the Italians and Greeks around their desires to gain territory in modern-day Turkey. Eventually, this desire would wane in Italy as governments changed and the situation altered, but it would take much longer for the feelings to dissipate in Greece. The British would be key drivers of some of these Greek desires, with Lloyd George being the most influential Western leader in the actions of the Allies in Anatolia during this period. Lloyd George's uh, almost obsession about the events in the region would eventually be a key reason cited for his removal as Prime Minister in 1922. Just as important to all these external actions that were happening around the world were internal actions, and those would be focused around Mustafa Kemal. Mustafa Kemal had been born in 1881 to a middle-class family in Salonika, modern-day Thessaloniki, in Greece. He was apparently a pretty good student during his early years, although any information about his early life has to be taken with some reserve, since all accounts of his early life come from his own recollections, which are always a bit, you know, suspect. He would then go on to join the army, in which he would serve until 1919. He would then be active in many of the empire's wars of the early 20th century, like the Balkans Wars. In 1913, he would be posted to the, as a military attaché to Sofia, the capital of Bulgaria. After the First World War began, he would stay in Sofia for a few months before being posted to command the 19th Division in January 1915. Over the next two years, he would go from commanding the division at Gallipoli to then being given command of the 7th Army in Palestine. He would later resign from this command, spending a few years working closely with the future Sultan. Then, in the last months of the war, he would once again be given command of the 7th Army. During the three months of this command stint, he would be in charge of the defense of the southern border of Anatolia, which was under threat from the British and Arab advances. One thing to take away from his service during this time is that he was not a particularly successful commander during the war. He had some high points, he had some low points. He was not the best general, but of course he was not even close to the worst. While the actions of the Allies and their occupation of the capital were important catalysts for actions among Turkish nationalists, a far larger role would be played by the Greeks. The actions of the Greeks and the British caused concerns among many Ottoman military leaders that with the end of the war, the country would be helpless to prevent encroachment from outside states, and possibly the loss of territory in Anatolia to Greek occupation. To try and prevent this, many of these leaders would take actions to try and conserve resources for possible future conflicts. This meant making military resources just, you know, disappear and a resistance to demobilization of the Ottoman military. These actions were at odds with both the agreements made with the Allies and the desires of the troops themselves, who really wanted the Ottoman military to demobilize as quickly as possible. At this point, Mustafa Kemal was just one of many generals that saw that the path the country was taking was not to his liking, and he began to play, plan for ways to change its possible future. He would later call this period the Dark Days of the Armistice, and he would claim that this period marked the beginning of his belief that the country had to fight back against outside influence. There were many nationalist military leaders scattered throughout Anatolia to command various units. However, since demobilization could not be entirely halted, many generals, many of which were strongly connected together in both beliefs and social status, were left without a command, and with a lot of time on their hands, and they were all now residing in the capital where they could, you know, talk about things. At this point, Mustafa Kemal was one of these military leaders, left without a war to fight or a government they believed they should serve. Many became distinctly politically active, advocating for a strong nationalist government that would fight back against outside influence, regardless of the consequences. The leaders of the official Turkish government were instead trying to work with the Allies, and because of this, the nationalist leaders began to cause problems. Even with his general distaste for the path that the government in Istanbul had chosen to take, Kemal still had good connections within that government, and so he would use those to get an assignment as Inspector of the 9th Army. This position took him months to arrange, but it would provide him with several advantages. Most importantly, it would allow him to freely travel around central and eastern Anatolia, and the specific boundaries of the position, both in geography and in specific actions that he could take, were, were fuzzy at best. His stated purpose, as permitted by the Allies, was to re-establish order in the region, prevent any banditry, and also to make sure that no Soviets were formed in the ranks of the Turkish military. 
This last requirement was added due to the fact that this time period was pretty much the height of concern among the Allies about communist expansion into the West. These tasks would prove to be perfect for Kamal's plans, because they would give him a lot of autonomy and also the ability to control most of the activities happening in eastern Anatolia. Kamal would arrive in Sumsun, a port on the Black Sea, on May 19th. Now this date is important because it is seen today as sort of the beginning of the Turkish War of Independence, which Kamal would lead. It was also just four days after the Greeks landed their troops at Smyrna, an event which we will discuss much more next episode. This landing by the Greeks crystallized and strengthened nationalist support, like foreign invasions often do, and they would also kick off a round of protests all over the country. Although May 19th is regarded as the beginning of the War of Independence, most of Kamal's early actions would revolve around trying to unite all the pre-existing nationalist movements around the country. Kamal did not need to create the nationalist movement that he would use to catapult himself to be the eventual leader of Turkey. He just needed to find a way to amplify, unify, and control it. There were small nationalist groups all over the country, many only present in small geographical areas, and Kamal hoped to be able to bring them together under the leadership of one person. Uh, of course, he wanted that one person to be him. On May 21st, Mustafa Kamal would notify the British officers in Samsung that he was departing for a tour of central Anatolia as part of his official duties. So every, everything was fine. But really, it would be at this point that his actions against the Allies and the governments in Istanbul truly began. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com slash gw50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. The two most important tasks in front of Mustafa Kemal were to create a military force out of the scattered bits of nationalist troops and to create some kind of political assembly that could claim to be legitimate leaders of the country. To create a military, Kemal would work with a bunch of leftover units from the old Ottoman army, generally just whatever was left which were then augmented by groups of volunteers. This second group could be broadly categorized as irregular troops. Maybe militia might be a good term as well. They were mostly just groups of ideologically motivated men who chose to fight for the nationalist idea. Kamal would work with other military leaders around him to form these units into something resembling an army. News of these actions and the formation of new military units would trickle out of Anatolia, with British officers quickly becoming concerned. They were the closest and in greatest danger, but there was little that the British could do to help. Lloyd George would have to turn to the Greeks, who agreed to provide more troops for security of the capital and for northern Anatolia. In exchange for this assistance, they wanted Allied permission to move out of Smyrna and to take over a much larger piece of territory. With the military side of the nationalist movement growing in strength, Kamal would turn to the political side of the problem. Kamal's views for the future of the political leadership of the country were captured and distributed in what would be called the Amsaya Tamimi which would be signed and distributed on June 21st. 
This document laid out Kemal's plans to create a national assembly, which instead of meeting in the western-controlled capital, would meet, at least initially, in Sivas in eastern Anatolia. He invited every administrative district to send three delegates to the assembly. The delegates from the eastern territories would be elected at a congress that would be held in Uzurum on July 10th, a congress that would be attended and if he had his way led by Mustafa Kemal himself. While there were some attempts to keep Sivris a, a secret, news of it would quickly reach the leaders in Istanbul, and their response was, well, it was not exactly forceful. A telegram would arrive from Mustafa Kemal from the Sultan. The contents were conciliatory. It suggested that Mustafa Kemal take a few months' leave, spend it wherever he wanted. It suggested that he not return to the capital, out of concern that foreign groups may harass him. Importantly, it did not even threaten to dismiss him from the army or as inspector of the Ninth Army. The telegram did not even directly criticize his actions up to this point, stating that the Sultan understood that Mustafa Kemal believed that he was working for the best future of the country, but the leaders in Istanbul did not believe that his actions were helping to make the best future a reality. It requested that he allow the situation to be managed from Istanbul. While the telegram from the Sultan was far less harsh than he feared, uh, Mustafa Kemal's failure to act in accord with it prompted further actions. The plan was to officially recall Kemal to the capital. However, he would learn of these plans before the official notification arrived. He then quickly resigned from the army. This resignation was a big step, and a risky one. Up to this point, even though he had not been working with the government in Istanbul, he, still had their, he was still their official representative as a leader of the military. He was also the highest military commander in the region, and this gave him powers to command troops and command resources. By resigning from his command, he just reverted back to Mustafa Kemal, citizen of the state, and all of those around him were no longer required to follow him. Kemal was genuinely concerned about his position, but he was greatly assisted by the actions of Kazim Karabikr. Karabikr was the inspector of the Third Army, and an officer held in high esteem by those around him. At the time that his resignation became public, Mustafa Kemal was actually staying with Karabekr, and when the announcement was made, he would address Mustafa Kemal and say, quote, I've come to pay my respects on behalf of all the officers and men under my command. You remain our respected commander, just as you've been until now. I brought a car and an escort of cavalry, as befits a corps commander. Pasha, we're all at your service. Karabikr and Kamal would have different views on many topics, and their relationship would be heated at times during the fighting. But Karabikr remained loyal until after the fighting was over. It wouldn't be until after the formation of the Turkish state that they would really grow apart. With his official resignation out of the way, his focus shifted to the Congress at Erzurum. This was a critical moment for the nationalist movement because among those attending the Congress were leaders of a large number of small, local nationalist groups from all over the eastern territories. If the nationalists wanted to succeed, it was important to get the support of these groups and then to unite them in common purpose. Mustafa Kemal saw it as the perfect way to grow his own power and prestige and to clearly assert himself as one of the leaders of the nationalist movement. When the Congress started, he would arrive in full military regalia, even though he was no longer a member of the military. He would then be elected to chair the Congress via a secret vote in which he received the vast majority of the votes. After this election to the chair, Kemal would move to create a representative committee. Now, this smaller group would be held responsible to lead the Congress and then to represent its interests when the Congress was not in session. Kamal was able to use his considerable influence to bring precisely the people that he wanted onto the committee, which would provide him a legitimacy that he had not had before. He, he was now a, a legitimate representative of the people. While Kamal was making these arrangements, the Congress was putting together a declaration. Now, this was a document that stated that the eastern provinces were united in their desire to see a new government that was free of outside influence, and that they were committed to maintaining all of the territory gained by the country in the armistice that had been signed in October 1918. They also stated that if they did not feel that the government in Istanbul was sufficiently representing the interests of the eastern territories, then they would be forced to create a provisional government that they felt would do so. The Congress gave the representative committee the power to form and lead this provisional government if they deemed it necessary, and the Congress, and the Congress didn't happen to be in session. After this declaration was finalized, the Congress was dismissed. The dismissal of the Congress put Mustafa Kemal, as head of the representative committee, in charge of the nationalist movement in the eastern half of the country. 
The government in Istanbul saw this new development as a threat to their legitimacy, and the Prime Minister, Demat Ferit, wanted to send in loyal troops to take control. However, to do so, he needed the permission of the Allies, who had to okay any Turkish military actions. Ferit wanted to send 2,000 troops to the south and east of the capital, but this request was refused. The Allies did not feel that this was a large enough force, but also did not want a larger force to be sent either. Their fear was the larger force would simply ignite a civil war, which the Allies did not want to happen. With his position clearly compromised, Farid resigned on, June, on September 28th. This resignation triggered elections, which is where things got interesting. The general consensus was that the elections would go heavily in favor of the nationalists, which was exactly what Mustafa Kemal wanted, but there were some complications. There was a risk that if enough of the representatives were elected to the new government that were not in Mustafa Kemal's faction, it would derail his plans to be made head of the government. The biggest problem was that Kemal was not, and could not, be in the capital, where many of the leading nationalists were still residing. But he did manage to get the personal agreement of Salih Pasha, who would oversee the elections, that he would move the assembly to Ankara. Now, this would move it out of the capital, and instead directly into the middle of Anatolia. This was very important for Mustafa Kemal and, and those loyal to him because that is precisely where their strength was. With this promise in mind, Mustafa Kemal moved on to his next task, which was to try and maintain the unity of the nationalist movement. The nationalists that were present in Turkey at this time came from many different former parties, one of which was called the CUP. The CUP were seen as some of the most extreme nationalists, and it had been CUP leaders that had brought the Ottoman Empire into the First World War in the first place. Many of the more moderate nationalists, many of which were in the capital, wanted a formal renunciation of the group by all nationalist leaders. Mustafa Kemal was very hesitant to do this because many of his supporters had formerly been members of the CUP. Instead, he wanted to advocate for keeping all the nationalists together in the name of staying united and fighting against foreign influence and invasion. He was successful at this, actually, and the nationalists would win a majority of the votes in the election. Mustafa Kemal would use his influence around the country to make sure elections were favorable to his faction of the nationalists specifically, and he would also get himself elected as the representative of Erzurum. With this step achieved, he next hoped to be elected as president of the new assembly in its first session. However, at this point, the plan got derailed a bit. To start with, even though Salil Pasha had told Mustafa Kemal that he would try to bring the assembly to Ankara, there was very little support in the capital to actually make this move. All of the elected officials, who were from the nationalist group but were not supporters of Kemal, were very aware of what he was trying to do, so they avoided it by refusing to house the assembly anywhere but the capital. With this part of his plan foiled, Mustafa Kemal still refused to attend the assembly meetings, and instead he would stay in Ankara. Many of those loyal to him that had been elected would move to the capital, after conferences with Kemal and other representatives, as they tried to come to an agreement about the best course of action. The goal of Mustafa Kemal staying away from the capital was that it would give him the ability to claim that he was a legitimate representative of the legitimate government, and if for any reason he could claim that they were not able to act freely, he would be able to claim the power to form a new government. If this was to be successful, it would still be useful to be elected president of the assembly, a task given to the representatives of his faction in the assembly that were actually in the capital. However, they would fail to accomplish this goal. And instead, another person, another nationalist, would be elected. But he would die a short time later. But then another one would again be elected, but this new uh, president was a nationalist, but he was a leader of a rival faction. Now, with both of his plans foiled, Mustafa Kemal was in an awkward position. He would not go to the capital, but all of his plans to influence events from afar seemed to be falling apart. In the capital, the newly elected government was having serious problems. They were in a situation very similar to what had happened to the leaders that they were replacing. They had poor relations with the Allies, mostly due to continued territorial demands beyond what the Allies wanted to accommodate. At the same time, they were trying to do the balancing act between working with the Allies and keeping enough of the nationalist coalition happy. This put them on a course of conflict with Mustafa Kemal and those loyal to him in Ankara. This ideological conflict, the Allied interactions with it, and then the galvanizing role of the Greek invasions will be our topic for next episode. I pick on it. Well,